to uh, uh, Trustee uh, Gannett uh, for the Program Student Achievement uh, Committee. Thank you, Chair Morris. Um, program is student, student Committee Achievement Committee meeting, October 12, 2021. I'll call the meeting to order. Um, there are uh, three agenda items. Uh, I move to approve this agenda. I'm looking for a seconder. Thank you, uh, Trustee Adam. Are there any uh, conflicts of interest? Not noted. Um, we have uh, three items on the agenda. Um, first up, we have uh, the summer learning report. And I'd like to introduce uh, our superintendent, Steve Block, so that he can introduce the people who are presenting on this topic. Hi, everyone. I'm uh, happy to welcome principals uh, Peter Burnett and Lisa Murphy. They're on the screen. Uh, they'll be joining us today with some of their staff to share uh, information about the summer learning program that they ran this year. Again, um, despite the issues that we face with COVID and being at home and everything else, uh, I think they did an excellent job of um, creating a lot of opportunity for students over the summer who wish to take part. And uh, so with no further ado, I will turn it over to Pete and Lisa. Okay, awesome. Hi, everybody. Thanks. Uh, can everybody hear us okay? Yeah. Yes. Absolutely. Okay, wonderful. So we're going to share our screen in a minute. And um, just for the sake of, of streaming and stuff, we'll turn off our camera, but we're going to be here in the background. So if you have any uh, any questions, of course, feel free to just interrupt us because we'll, we'll be sharing our screen. We won't see you. Uh, I know there's questions at the end, but if there's anything that needs immediate clarification, of course, uh, feel free to jump in if that works for everybody. Oops. Yes, thank you. Okay, so I'm going to uh, turn off my camera and share my screen. Okay. Are we good? Can everybody see that? Yes. Okay, wonderful. Okay. So I will go first. Um, it's Lisa here. I was in charge of, uh, I was principal for the elementary summer learning program. And this year, this year the funding allowed us to offer um, a tiered type support to summer learning. So each classroom was able to have one teacher and one EA. And then there was a cert uh, shared between classrooms. And, and this year we hired some virtual liaisons as well. Who were, who, who were leading a small cluster of classrooms, and then a school support counselor for primary junior and another one for junior intermediate. So we had a, a wealth of, of support for the classrooms this year, and that allowed us to offer some small group intervention as well as some wonderful um, team approach to planning and, and teaching. So we also did something a little bit different this year with regard to assessment. And in past, past years, we found that the pre-assessment and the post-assessment was taking up a lot of time out of the program. So this year, thanks to Shelley Gagne, as it was her uh, brilliant idea, she suggested that um, we use some of our coach, our instructional coaches, and we do the pre-assessment prior to the beginning of the program. And that, was, that turned out to be a very successful strategy. Luckily, two out of the three liaisons of our program are actually instructional coaches for our board. So um, they were able to get all the primary assessment done prior to the start date. And that allowed us more, um, more intentional groupings when we were making up the classes. And it allowed teachers to have time for instruction and time that wasn't necessarily just spent on assessment because as we know that takes up a lot of time. Along with the liaisons we made decisions to use um, for, for classrooms we used the Lawson math continuum and the math talks which are highly used throughout our board. We thought it made sense um, to use teaching strategies that were already familiar to our educators. 
And we also had a wide use of math games uh, to, pr to promote engagement and also as an extension to learning. So at the end of the program, when teachers were developing report cards to send home to parents, they also, for primary grades, they also included a math game as an extension so that families could continue the learning into, um, into the, for the rest of the summer. Sorry if I'm going too quickly. If you have any questions, just stop us. Um, the parent and the student feedback was very positive this year. In fact, most of the, the feedback that maybe was not so positive was really about things that we didn't have in our control, like COVID and the fact that we were meeting virtually instead of in person. Um, but to, but parents were very positive about the program. And I think it was mostly, um, again, because of the, the wide range of supports that we had in place, thanks to the funding. As well, the teacher feedback. Um, I wish I could put more of the feedback from, uh, from teachers and from families on into the slideshow because it was really, really positive, but I've tried to highlight a few different areas. So, um, most of the resounding, resounding support was again for the teamwork, the range of the range of resources, because of course that helps with engagement and uh, the high retention rate that we were able to have this year. In, in in other years, or I should say last year with the virtual program, we had students dropping out at a higher rate uh, than we did this summer, and I think it was because um, we were able to have some small groupings some one-to-one -one support with, with the EAs and the certs. And so that, that really kept, um, kept kids interested in the program. Also, uh, Lexia, a little plug for Lexia. We used it again this year. It's the language, it's the online language program. And it was very well received by staff, but as well as families. Lots of positive feedback about Lexia. And we were, allowed, we were able to offer families to continue to use Lexia with their students. Uh, to, until mid-August. So that was a real, real plus for families. And the, um, the third thing I just wanted to highlight was again, um, the decision to do the data collection prior to the program. And so that teachers had that data from day one and um, they were able to really target, target kids' needs. Some of the challenges I won't, um, there weren't many surprises, and I think some of the, the virtual challenges that we experienced in summer learning would be the same challenges that, you know, we were experiencing for all, you know, virtual learning through the year as well. Um, like they're not definitely not exclusive to summer learning. Um, so technology always to, technology always has, um, has challenges. As great as it is, it always has its challenges. Home environments, again, it's, um, it's really difficult for some families to um, to support the learning and to be able to dedicate a space in their home that's um, that's just for learning, so that's tricky. Student interest and engagement, as you know, as positive as we thought it was, of course, of course, it could always use improvement. Um, and then something that was interesting that was highlighted again and again over the summer was um, the difficulty that parents have in allowing their child to struggle. So. We worked away at that with parents over the over the course of the three weeks through communications about it's you know the struggle is part of the learning, um, so that's something that we would continue to do and that you know making sure that parents know that that's it's okay for your child not to have all the answers right away and that's that that struggle is is part of the process. Um, and then lastly, just to highlight, you know, something else, and here we are with our cameras off because of, <laughs> because we're trying to avoid, um, you know, any glitches or anything, but it's very difficult for any of you who have ever uh, taught virtually, it's very difficult to engage learners when they don't have their cameras on, but that's just something that uh, we continue to work at. I invited... Um, Jordan Sloan here today. I just wanted to showcase how brilliant the role of, of the liaison was this summer, not only in terms of supporting students, but the richness that, richness that our liaisons brought um, 
from a from an instructional perspective. So she's going to talk about her experience as a virtual liaison with summer learning. Welcome, Jordan. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you, everyone. I'm Jordan Sloan. I am the bilingual literacy coach for Pembroke and Opiongo. And I was one of the summer liaisons. So I got to work in both capacities doing some of the early assessments with the literacy and numeracy coaches, as well as moving into the role. And we, it was great because, like Lisa said, we got to start right away with virtual interviews with students. So we completed a sound skill screener to assess student phonemic awareness and a quick phonics screener to determine letter sound knowledge and early reading skills. We used the Lawson continuum. So we did some math interviews and we were able to plot students along the learning continuum. Um, and that we could use all of that, pass it on to teachers and work with them so that right away they were starting work with students. They weren't spending that first week as we have in the past doing those initial assessments. Um, we also worked with teachers prior to the startup to do the Lexia training to input all the students into Lexia and have that ready to go uh, to establish virtual classrooms, to do any new tech things that they wanted to try out. Um, we created a letter template and did some communicating with parents right away. And then we got all of our divisions together and got the teachers and the educators and the EAs that were in the space, the SSCs, everybody got to know each other, which was great. Once the program began, we were sounding boards for educators. So we were able to discuss any struggles that learners were facing and try to work through sharing ideas, uh, sometimes popping into classrooms to help out, sometimes going into breakout rooms with those students. Um, and we were able to provide answers that maybe didn't have to go to the administrator. We could work through some of the issues with our teachers. Another great advantage was that we were able to offer professional learning to our educators. So every day an email was sent out building on the literacy assessments that were done. So for example, we discussed the importance of building on phonemic awareness with beginner readers and then provided guidance on how to use the resources that were available to teachers in their virtual classrooms right away. The teachers had some built-in planning time in their schedules, so we were also able to do some live sessions. Uh, we did a numeracy session introducing them to the Lawson continuum and the developmental progression of addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division, and then how to really target groups of students with math games, with activities that they could do in the classroom and that students could do at home with their parents. Our final task was the creation of the student progress reports. So in order to allow the teachers and educators as much time as possible with the students, we kind of set out the whole template for them to showcase the learning that had been completed over the three weeks. We included activities and games that they could continue throughout the summer, as well as the Lexia access that they had until the end of August. And then teachers went in and personalized with some comments. So overall, it was a great summer. It was a great role in a, the liaison position, and I'm grateful that I got to do it. Thank you, Jordan. Okay, uh, and so I'll just take over for a few minutes and talk a little bit about summer learning uh, for secondary students. And later on in this presentation, I'm gonna introduce you to Alex Harris, although he needs no introduction, uh, I'm sure. But uh, to talk about uh, item number three up here, the dual credit opportunity. So uh, with secondary students, of course, the goal is always about the development of global competencies, the same way it is in, in elementary schools, but it's also about, um, you know, building some of those core skills and the knowledge for the curriculum that they're going to be taking on in the summer. Um, and, and at the end of the day, we want them to earn credits because um, their their time spent in the summer goes towards, uh, you know, credit bearing opportunities. And so this past summer, there were three different ways that students could earn credits in summer learning. Um, they could take e-learning courses again through the consortium. Um, they could do cooperative education in our district. And they're also, which Alex will speak to later, was this really incredible dual credit uh, opportunity. So they could earn both college and high school credits. And Alex will speak to that in more detail uh, in a few minutes. So just very quickly, uh, 152 students took advantage of e-learning opportunities through the consortium. And, and that's, a, that's a significant number of students who were able to um, redo credits and or get ahead, move ahead in credits. Um, they, these these are, are courses that sometimes we don't have the opportunity to offer within our, our county. And that's the benefit of, of our board being part of the Ontario e-learning consortium. 
we have a chance to give our students opportunities to take some of these credits. And so 152 students took e-learning, uh, 135 were successful. So we only had 17 who, for various reasons, personal, other, were not able to, to follow through on it, but 135 credits earned through e-learning this summer, which is fantastic. When we uh, found out that we once again had approval from the Renfrew County uh, District Health Unit and the cooperation from them to allow summer co-op to go ahead face-to-face -face again this summer. Uh, we initially put it out to students and we had, I think, 86 originally signed up. By the time the summer got, got started, that dropped down to 81, but that was enough students to warrant three different teachers offering summer co-op this year in our district, ranging from opportunities in Armprior all the way up to opportunities, um, Deep River, Barry's Bay, and um, you know the far stretches of our county. So great opportunity for students, uh, lots of really practical, hands-on learning opportunities, most of which were paid jobs as well. So students were able to earn some money in summer co-op while they were demonstrating successful competency in the co-op uh, curriculum. And so uh, 71 students found success in summer co-op. And that range, there was some that were attempting one credit, some were attempting two credits, but every student um, that participated got something out of it, whether they ended up completing the full program or not. But but 71 students successfully completing co-op, that's, that's fantastic, especially in a pandemic. And Alex is going to talk, uh, you know, a little bit more about that dual credit. But we had 17 students that were able to take part in a two-week dual credit program. Uh, all were successful in that. And so, uh, when you learn more about that, you'll you'll see that that too was a, a pretty wonderful opportunity for our kids. So our summer co-op, there uh, again. We, we did have approval to do it, but the health unit did want us to make sure that we had the same protocols in place, you know, so that we were keeping our students and staff safe. So COVID protocols included physical distancing, the personal hygiene, the per personal protective equipment, of course, and that our co-op students had to be aware of what the expectations were at their place of employment, and they had to be agreeing that they were going to follow those those uh, conditions because those those employers were, were liable to make sure that they were following the guidelines set out by the health unit. We wanted uh, check-ins to be virtual where possible. We wanted um, uh, you know any any site visits to happen where possible virtually using technology, but also uh, if it had to happen in, in person, that was allowed. And they were allowed to do that as long as uh, staff members were following the COVID safety protocols integration activities, reflection assignments. Uh, over this last year and a half, our co-op teachers have developed a bit of an expertise in terms of allowing students those opportunities to reflect on their learning. And again, we know that they, they had experiential learning cycles about giving students a, a chance to experience something, to then give them a chance to reflect on that experience and then apply whatever they've learned about that uh, with that reflection to other learning in their life, to other aspects of their life. And so that experience reflect and apply cycle is really how co-op thrives because we give our kids a chance to experience something authentic in the workplace. And our summer co-op allows for that to happen as well. So we're really thrilled that we were able to, to do it. These next couple slides don't require a lot of talking. They're just sort of some examples of some pictures that I asked our co-op teachers to share with me, uh, some skills, some on the job things that were happening. So you can see we've got some landscaping happening here. Uh, we've got a, a, a student involved in um, some office work where there's some sanitization happening and some students in, in retail stocking shelves, et cetera. But all of that providing those kids with opportunities to, to think about how that learning might impact them in the future, things that they might want to do for themselves as a possible second career. Um, what I love about co-op is that uh, it, it really does allow opportunities for all pathways. So we have students that are going to finish with us after grade 12 and go straight to the workforce. And we have other kids that are going to go to college and some that might go to university and some that will follow an apprenticeship pathway. And Alex is going to speak more to that in a few minutes as well. From our students, they wanted to say thank you to our co-op teachers. 
They appreciate the flexibility. They appreciate learning from other people, people that they don't normally get a chance to see. Um, and they recognize that it, it's hard to be a summer co-op teacher, a lot of expectations. And so our students are saying, thank you for that experience. Um, one of our co-op teachers asked students to give some tips to students that we're gonna be doing co-op in September. And some insightful things come out here. Some of our students were saying things like, get along with your fellow employees, learn how to do that. Teamwork is so crucial to being successful. And if you can become part of a team, you're gonna find that, that you're stronger together. I, I like that quote. Um, you know, the top quote was talking about the importance of always making sure that you're trying your best, do your best, give your best to every opportunity that you have, and you'll grow more from that, you'll advance farther. So some really good tips for people. And then one final reflection, it's kind of wordy. So I just highlighted uh, some key points, not being afraid to make mistakes. Um, learn from those mistakes so that you can prevent them the next time. Um, I, I highlighted get involved and build good relationships with your coworkers and then get as much experience as you can. And all of these, you know, part of this student who, who gave this final reflection really understood what it meant to, uh, to be part of a co-op program and to take full advantage of it, that networking piece, that learning from all, every experience you have. And again, that speaks to that experiential learning cycle, doesn't it, right? Experience something, reflect on it, and then apply that learning to other aspects of your life. And here is where I get to turn it over to Alex. And Alex, I, I want to, uh, I invited Alex to join us to, to talk about this dual credit trades camp. And I mean, if you've had a chance to listen to Alex speak before, you're gonna hear the passion, of course, that, that comes from him about these opportunities. And he understands full well, um, you know, our trades are, are not, don't have to be a fallback option. This is the first choice for kids and, and should be. And this dual credit trades camp gave us a real opportunity to allow 17 kids to explore. So Alex, I'm going to turn it over to you and you can tell us more about this opportunity. Will do. Thanks very much, Peter. And uh, good afternoon, everyone. Wonderful to see uh, some of you and hopefully one day back in person, uh, we can do this again. So just to be quickly on what uh, dual credit trades camp kind of mistake courses to fit what our students were demanding uh, because, of course, they had been forced into, uh, you know, missing school because of uh, the pandemic. So we uh, were able to build on the success of the Level 1 Carpentry program that took place in Quad 4 of the last academic year and lead right into a summer event where for the first two weeks of July, we had RCBSB students from all of our schools, five, pardon me, five of our seven schools represented, and there it is. Thank you very much. Students as young as grade 10, uh, grade 11, grade 12, and uh, they were basically picked up each day for two weeks and they were cabbed to the college or to the college woodshop where they basically took two college half credits. Um, so it's really small on the screen, but long story short, they did some welding and they did some work on construction and collaborating with other trades. Our target group was for young women, uh, Indigenous students or those who identify as young women or uh, First Nations, Métis and Inuit students and also anyone else from a group that was historically underrepresented in the trades. And uh, Pete, may I have the next slide, please? So just a couple pictures here. We can just roll through these quickly, uh, uh, Peter, if you don't mind. So there's some students doing some work here at the college, uh, doing some cutting, doing some welding. So what did they earn from doing this? So we had room for 18. Uh, we did have 18 start the first day, but it, it went down to 17 right, right that day. So we had two, co two college half credits. So each student earned one full college credit, and that will apply if they go to a, a college in Ontario as at the very least an elective for them. Uh, and if they get into these programs at Algonquin where these college half credits are a part of, then certainly that will help towards that specific program. They also earned a secondary credit. So that goes on their, uh, their transcript and you can see the code there. They got safety boots and welding gear to keep and they also got to receive uh, just an audio presentation, like a virtual presentation from Dr. Callagher about the skilled trades. Next slide, please, Mr. Burnett, if you don't mind. And there's no point in me rambling on about this. Uh, I would really like for you to hear from these two students. So the first student we'll hear is, is Evelyn. And uh, fingers crossed, let's hear what Evelyn had to say about her experience.
If you can't hear, I don't know if you can, but if you can't hear, there's a pop-out button in the top of the screen that may help. So I'm guessing no one can hear. Uh, I can fill in the blanks if you want a little bit, but <laughs> long story <laughs> short, uh, Pete, perhaps if you, in the top right, top uh, right of each video, there should be a little arrow for pop out that shows up when you hover over it. If not, we could, uh, we could share it in a different way if you'd like, or you can look at it later. Uh, there it is right there. So that should pop it open if you don't mind. Thank you, sir. So this is an audio issue, it sounds looks like with the somewhere in the hardware, it's not broadcasting, but uh, we'll make sure you can get this. And, and if, uh, if anybody wants to play around with it for a moment, please do. But I'll just tell you real quick, um, that was a student who was from uh, Madawaska Valley, and uh, she had come to us from uh, Canterbury in Ottawa. And, uh, okay, we don't have it yet. Um, so long story short, we're just talking to Evelyn about, about her what she's learning in the welding uh, uh, studio at the college. And the neat thing about this student is, um, they had a visitor, it was uh, kind of beamed into their careers class and, you know, plugged this event and she signed up because moving back here from Ottawa, she had two or three welders in her grandpa's, you know, uh, farm where she was living uh, up by Brutonelle and, uh, you know, wanted to learn how to use them. So she's creating art um, to her to her passion uh, using uh, MIG welding, arc welding, etc. So pretty neat. We, we don't have to try it again, Pete. I'll let you kind of just choose and we can share this somehow if, it, if the audio doesn't want to go. I think it's internal to the device, but long story short, you can see these, the kids have a lot of good things to say. And uh, this is two of our prize students. They all earned the credit and uh, thank you for your support. Take any questions that, uh, that you might have. Oh, there we go. Here's another slide, look at that. Um, so our partners were, yeah, our partners were the both school boards. So uh, us and our sister board, both Algonquin colleges in order to get the logistics uh, correct. Every student was successful, the parents loved it. I mean, um, anytime we do these things, parents always say, where was this when I was a kid? So same kind of idea. Um, they were really wanting to have that hands-on work. As you know, students uh, in some cases earned a construction credit or a woodworking credit in quad four last year without ever having touched a tool. So there was a real desire for students to touch tools. And so that was great. Uh, we're hearing from tech ed teachers this semester that have these students, that these students have a bit of a, a, bit of a, a jumpstart on those folks. So. Go ahead, we'll put that in drive, I suppose. You can take a look at the videos um, at your leisure time if you wanna see what they say. And uh, I mean, the students say it all. Thank you for the chance to uh, speak to this today. Great, thanks Alex, appreciate you doing that. And, and sorry that the volume didn't work. We'll uh, we'll try, as Alex said, make that available. It is really neat to hear the, the perspective from the students. And again, uh, what you'll find is that they certainly really appreciate it. I think the next slide speaks to um, our fresh start. And so Jacqueline, I, I don't know if you're there to want to speak to this or not. Sure, Pete, I can do so. Thanks. I um, just wanted to include that we did have an opportunity for our transitions again at the end of the summer heading into the school startup. So through funding from the ministry to support um, students with complex special education needs or mental health needs, they were able to run that again. and. You can see at the bottom, it was 19 of our schools, 63 staff members and 500 students that were able to access that. And it looked different from building to building because it's differentiated for the needs of the kids and what they're asking for. So it could be just coming in and, and uh, seeing the classroom that they're going to, trying to relieve some anxiety, for example, meeting people that they're going to be uh, interacting with and once they start school again. They might work on some academics if that was something that was a concern. Um, just a chance really to reconnect with staff and help with that smooth transition back to school. Thanks, Peter. Thank you. And just finally, thank you to um, to all the stakeholders in the last slide. It de summer learning is definitely a team effort. So, you know, thank you to the board and the ministry and all our dedicated educators. Um, without everybody working together, we couldn't we couldn't do summer learning. So thank you to everyone. Thank you. So that's that's it formally. Um, I don't know if there's questions or if you want us to re revisit any slide or. 
if there's an appetite from the group, I can try to present from my screen to see if the audio works with videos, or else we can, of course, just uh, just share them with you, depending on your agenda and time. Yeah, I, I think we just share them, Alex, and then people can watch them. Yeah. Sounds good. Thanks. Uh, as Chair Susan Humphreys, uh, fellow trustee, has a question. Thanks very much for that great presentation and the slide deck certainly helped to put into uh, in, into the context the numbers of people that were involved here. I, I guess I'm wondering, I mean, we have 160 elementary and 152 secondary. Is that sort of the, I, I know it wouldn't be the norm compared to last year maybe, but is it is it more than usual over the last five years or and I know you've had more staff, so that makes a difference as well. But I'm just wondering how that compares and and were they pretty much across the district or or were there pockets that were missed? And I wonder why and that was the case. It does it does seem to be up. And um when I when I met with the fellow from the ministry in the summer, he was saying that province wide there is more of an app, maybe not necessarily an appetite, but for a variety of reasons, that numbers for virtual learning are up compared to in-person learning in the summer. So that's province-wide, actually, and as well as our board. Yeah, and I think secondary from that through that perspective, uh, or through that lens, rather, it, it's up a bit as well. And I, I think that part of it, um, you know, there was certainly some students who didn't maybe have an opportunity to do face-to-face uh, -face co-op in the regular school year they you know things were a little bit different and this kind of presented an opportunity for them to get back to that that authentic range so we actually last year had two sections of summer co-op this this year we had three and it um it was a night it was a nice increase and, and certainly we were able to accommodate them all and, and that's a wonderful opportunity for kids uh, supplement just a quick follow-up i guess i'm wondering what's what's the thinking for next summer and i know some of it would depend on funding right because i'm assuming we did have and i don't know how much but we got extra funding this year but are there some learnings from this year that you would project for next year or things that you want to keep in mind and uh, it sounds like such an excellent way for students to stay engaged but also to learn new things, pick up new credits. It's just a wonderful opportunity. So so I think even though the numbers are all up, I think for primary, you know, if we're able to go back to the in-person model for primary students, I think that that's always the preference. But I, but I do agree that there's something to learn, to be learned here from, um, from the high numbers in junior intermediate. And if, if we haven't always offered those, uh, those programs in the past, but it would definitely be something to think about for the, those older students at elementary. Yeah, and I think, you know, I think that both elementary and or secondary, you know, one thing for sure, we're, we're starting to develop a competence around, you know, hybrid models of learning too. And so we don't know where we're gonna be at with the pandemic. We all hope, I think, <laughs> with our fingers crossed, that we're, we're you know, we're kind of getting on the, the, the downward slope of this. And, and hopefully we'll be back to what we would consider operating as usual, but, I think that um, you know, as our educators become more familiar with how to use technology effectively, even if we are in a hybrid model where we can take advantage of some of the things that we've done well this year and learn from this year, we'll, we'll you know we'll keep working towards that. I think Lisa referenced that that um, the idea of doing some pre-assessments before the summer because we know who our participants are, and that was a strategy I think that she mentioned worked really really well, and we can continue doing some of those things. So I appreciate that question because we are always thinking about how we can, you know, learn from our experiences, reflect on those and apply them as educators even. We, we talked about the importance of students doing that and I think you've nailed it. That's a really good question. We, we of course, um, have notes on what went well this year and we'll apply those to next year's program. We, we probably, funding permitting, uh, be offering some similar programs. So hopefully the numbers warrant them and, and um, we find a way to engage our kids in the summer as well next year. Great. And thanks very much. It'd be interesting to see whether a hybrid model might work because you're right. We're hoping next year we can get back to a more more normal, I guess, uh, situation. Yeah. But for some kids, the hybrid piece may be a, a good answer as well. So anyway, thank you for, for excellent presentation. Appreciate it. Are there any other questions or comments? Just in, just in closing, uh, 
I do have uh, two things to say. One is uh, I'm really pleased to see, because of the importance of COVID happening, uh, the Fresh Start program. I just can't under underestimate the probably the hidden importance that we may not see as much immediately, but down the road, just that reconnection. I'm really pleased and I'm sure on behalf of all the trustees, we feel the same way. And this my second thing is, uh, this more probably goes to Alex Harris, the dual credit, Alex, um, did you have many more applications and did you sort of screen those students? Is it like, like I would look at that as I would just jump on that if I was a teenager. Did you have numbers that you sort of had to figure out a way to pare down those numbers to 17, 18 students or? Yeah, so great question. Thanks, Trustee Gannett. Um, and just very quickly, we do hope to offer more dual credit uh, next summer as well, whether that looks like a school within a college or another trades camp offering. So these students, because of COVID restrictions at the college, we could only take 18. Uh, long story short, they were broken down into two groups of nine, and the shop was you know, cut in half by a curtain, and that, that satisfied the health unit. So we had only room for 18, and we did have more applicants, but we were quite lucky because the ones that did apply uh, over the uh, 18 threshold were actually excluded because of their age. So there are some policy requirements in school college work initiative or SCWI or dual credit that basically, you know, eliminate, let's say, some grade nine. So we had many, many interested students who were in that age range, but just couldn't attend. And uh, we started off with 18, but on day one, uh, one student decided that that wasn't for them. And at that point, we couldn't fill the last seat. Um, but I hope that answers your question. Yeah, it does. It just uh, the statistics are remarkable. When you think of, you know, 17 really were there for the whole duration, 17 obtained what they went there to require to do. I know it's an expensive program. So it just goes to show you that uh, the, the, the success rate's there. So thank you. Uh, Director Poponi has a question. Thank you, through, Mr. Chair. Just wanted to share with Jordan and Alex, uh, Lisa and Pete, thank you so much for all your efforts in the summer program and to everyone involved. As has been shared, it's such a, a value added initiative for our district. And I, I know how busy the last 18 plus months have been. So thank you so much for all the time and effort you put into this program during a time period when most others are, are gearing down a little bit more than normal. I, I know you were really ramped up to make sure it was successful. So uh, our sincerest thanks. Uh, thank you. And as chair, I just wanted to echo uh, Director Buffoni's uh, thoughts. I was going to conclude with that, but I appreciate that. You took my thunder, but that's great. I appreciate it. Um, I guess our first item uh, has come to a uh, conclusion. Uh, there's no more questions. Okay. okay. Thanks, folks. We really appreciate you taking the time today. We'll see you later. Thanks again. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Make sure to watch those videos. <laughs>
just going to go through some of the highlights. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the plan, like Steve said, and some of the things that we'll be working on this year, but mainly the highlights of what we accomplished over the summer and kind of some direction of where we go next. So like Steve said, in the package, there were four documents. The first one is a uh, an update of, the, so of year three. So you'll see in the yellow, uh, sorry, in the blue box, year three update. Uh, to start off that update, it talks a lot about the stuff that we did in the summer. One thing I do want to point out, there are some numbers in here regarding devices and stuff that were items that were returned. Ignore those numbers because we've got new numbers as of Friday. So those numbers have been updated and I'll go through those in the slideshow as we go through. Also included in the package is the full three-year plan. So if you ever want to go back and look at the entire three-year plan that we had, and there's a copy in there. There's a document that outlines the four-year educator de device deployment. So those are uh, teachers, ECEs that are getting laptop, and EAs that are getting Chromebooks, and what year, what schools that are getting them. And then as well as the four-year classroom mobile deployment schedule. So those are each of the schools in the four years uh, that are getting new devices, new mobile devices. That, that would be Chromebooks and iPads. So that's when they get their devices replaced. So we had one huge goal this summer, and we set the goal right at the start, and that's what we focused on. And that goal was for the start of the 2021-22 school year, every school will have the exact number of Chromebooks that they were either funded by ICT within the last four years, so that's their mobile allocation that we give them, or funded by the school in the last four years. So devices that the school had money to go out and buy on top of the devices that ICT provided to them. So we wanted schools fresh start in September. So even if they lost devices before the pandemic even started, so devices just you know walked out the door or or broken, we wanted to make sure to start the school year they had the exact number of devices that they should have according to our master inventory list. So we had some milestones that we needed to accomplish in order to do this. The first thing we had to do is we had to clean, prep, test, and return all ICT funded and school funded Chromebooks borrowed since the start of the pandemic back into the schools. So what we did in each school, we provided a large tote in the main office and any devices that were returned at the end of June or at the start of September went into that tote. And then as the text got into the schools, they were able to go through the totes, determine whether that device was current. So it's, no, it's uh, not figure four years old yet. If it's not four years old, it goes back into the school. If it's over four years old, it comes out of the school because it's, it's end of life, your EOL. That task was completed. We needed to go back and complete some work that we weren't able to do last year. So one of those tasks was to complete the summer removals. So every summer we go into schools, we look at four-year-old devices and we take them out of schools. They breach their lifeline, we pull them out. So of course we couldn't do that last year because those devices were in the hands of students at home. So we had to go back and do that job. That was done. Then we had to do the same for 2021. So we didn't get to do it in 2020. We had to, we didn't get to do it in 2021 either. So we had to go back then and take all the stuff that should come out this summer and pull all that stuff out of the schools. That was done. Uh, we had to complete Chromebook removals for schools that received their mobile allocation in 2021. So those schools were given their new devices. But we again, we didn't have the old ones to take out of the school because they were still in hands of kids. So we had to get those out of the school and that was done. And we thought, well, we're on a roll now. Why not do some stuff for next year? <laughs> so we actually went in and we uh, put all the news of mobile devices that schools were to get for this current school year into the school over the summer. So they had them for the start of the school year. So we actually did over the course of uh, two months, three years worth of work to get the three school years. And then we also deployed all school purchase Chromebooks. There was a lot of schools that had extra funding this year and able to, were able to buy some extra devices. So we were able to get those devices into the schools as well. And uh, there were some large orders that we had to put together and get out. Uh, schools that ordered iPads as part of their 2021, 2022 allocation. So this year allocation, uh, of course we couldn't order those till September due to budget, uh, but they have been ordered. They have arrived and we are prepping those and trying to get those out to the schools right now. And those are for Central, Beachburg, Adamaston, Highview, ADH, OHS, and MVD. So all those schools ordered iPads, and those are going in for the school very shortly into those schools. There are a couple of things we didn't get to. I don't know if you drive past a car lot nowadays, you look and see there's no cars on the lot. Mainly chip shortages, well, we're facing the same thing. So we had an issue with teacher laptops last year. We ordered teacher laptops 
and they were almost a full year before we were able to get them. Uh, so we've got these teacher laptops now, they're prepped. Uh, we've verified the staffing at all these schools who's supposed to get them, and we're deploying those now. So that project is underway for AJC, CDS, Coffin, Urban, Rockwood, and Walters Annual. So those teachers, ECEs, and EA should have got devices last school year. They will get them this school year. And then we'll have this school year's uh, to do as well. We're still facing those shortages of devices. We're still having issues getting stock. Uh, we've also been, we've been told that it'd be more than likely next year before we can get more devices from, from our vendors. So it's very difficult getting uh, technology right now of any sort for our school, but we're, we're doing our best. There's one other project that we have to go back and do. There's a number of Windows desktop computers that we located that should have been removed a couple of years ago. They weren't when all this went down. Uh, so we have to go back and pull those out as well. And we'll be talking to those schools individually. It doesn't affect all the schools, just a few schools. So we're talking about uh, RC, uh, the Chromebook and my inventory. So those were the two main devices that we used during the pandemic. Chromebooks that we loaned out to all the kids. We didn't touch iPads. Uh, we try not to load out iPads because they're very expensive. Uh, they damage easily. They're they're hard to repair. So it was easier to get Chromebooks out. They're cheaper, uh, easy again, easy to repair, easy uh, to fix if we if we really had to. So we load out a lot of Chromebooks, a lot of MiFi internet devices. They internet, if you haven't seen them, they look like a cell phone, a little bit thicker, about the same size. But for families who didn't have internet access at home, that's what we provided to them. Uh, we have them on our corporate plan. Uh, so at minimum, it's $15 a month for each of those Wi-Fi for internet access, maximum $50 a month. So it's, it's a lot better than most of us pay for our own cell, our own service at home. So we conducted a thorough inventory of all uh, our CDSB owned Chromebooks and Wi-Fi. The Chromebooks were inventory cleaned and prepared for return to classrooms. Wi-Fi internet devices were inventory cleaned and returned to the ICT department because we don't typically deploy those to students. School Chromebooks that were not physically located were deemed as missing and replaced with pandemic funded Chromebooks. So we did get ministry funding to buy more devices and that's what we use to top up the schools where we were missing devices. So everybody had the correct number of devices that it should have. I put missing in quotes here because missing means we didn't physically find them. They could have been in a drawer somewhere. They could have been in a teacher's closet. We couldn't find them. So they were deemed as missing and they were turned off. They were disabled. Uh, there was a note placed, and you'll see shortly, there was a note placed on every screen. So if somebody opened one up and it was disabled, it would say on the screen, please return this to your school main office. Once we got our hands on it, we could decide that, well, do we need to enable it or do we need to take it out of the school because it's four years old. Um, so missing just means we couldn't get our hands on it. There was a lot of those propped up in September, of course, when teachers come back and open their closet door and went, oh, you know, I tried to fire it and they said disabled contacts your main office, then we activated those devices. Again, this ensured that each school started with the exact number of devices that they were supposed to have. So again, I talked about the screen. So Chromebooks that were deemed as missing were locked to prevent them from being used. And a message was displayed on the screen asking that they be returned to the school's main office. And all of the MiFi internet devices were disabled at the start of the summer. So everything was turned off. So if it wasn't brought back, they couldn't, a student couldn't be surfing at home also or watching movies on our internet device. So. A detailed classroom uh, Chromebook report was provided to each school indicating which Chromebooks were found and which Chromebooks were not found and replaced. I'm going to show you a copy of what that report looks like that was given to every school. It was a lot of work, so credit to the team that put everything together. So this is the report from Herman Street. I brought it up because they, they, they covered all the bases. They, there's five different sections of the report and they had devices in every section. So the first section is IT funded or IT allocated Chromebooks that were found in the school. 
So these are all the devices that we found in the school that belong to Herman Street that were bought by IT, the IT department. A lot of devices, we found them all. They were all clean, prepped, and ready to go. Section two is school purchase Chromebooks that were found. So these were Chromebooks that were funded by Herman Street in this case, and we were able to locate, clean, prep them, and get them into the classroom. Section three is IT allocated school purchase Chromebooks that were not found. And this is an important section. So in the blue, or blue are devices that were taken home for students this summer for remote learning. So again, we couldn't physically touch the device, so we considered it as missing, even though we had an idea where it was, because it wasn't back in our possession. So the blue is remote learning students device, and the yellow are devices that we just didn't find. We couldn't locate them anywhere. So in order to help the school out in locating these devices, we went through and beside every device that was in the missing section, we provided some information for the school. Who the student was that had the device, and if they were using it for some learning or not. And in some cases, if we didn't know the last user, we, we provided uh, where it was used last. Like if we knew it was used by a Bell, through a Bell internet provider in our prior, we provided that information as well. So it did help the school determine that somebody in their school had that device out. So we, we give them as much information as possible to help them track down those devices. But then you see in this case, they were able to go back they were able to go back and see all the students who should have or who did sign out that device. And they'll be able to go to that student and say, hey, you borrowed this device. We need to get it back. So as of today, these devices are, would still be outstanding at Herman Street in this case. So in order to top up all devices, we had to give an equivalent number. If they were missing, we had to give the equivalent number of top up. So if you were missing 10 devices, we topped up your school with 10 more devices. Uh, pandemic funded devices. So those that's uh, ministry funding that we received to buy additional devices. And that's where that came from. And then we give every school a summary of all the devices. So how many were found, how many are missing, how many top ups were given. Uh, so they could easily go back and see how their school was doing it with regards to getting their devices back. So we did that for every single school and provided that to every <laughs> every principal and vice principal. So you can see how it would be a lot of work to pull all that information together and get them all those details, uh, especially when you got schools like Valor with 600 devices, you know, those kind of, kind of stop presenting for a second. Just going to go back to the slideshow. So let's talk about the numbers. The, the missing devices. So of the 4,350 Chromebooks that should be in schools, so that's both ICT and school funded, 257 or 5.9% are missing as of October 12th, so as of today. Uh, not a bad number, it's really not. Uh, we, When we were talking to the other ICT departments, when this was all happening last year, most school boards expected to be in the 20% loss range, uh, so we're not too bad. The numbers will get a little bit higher here in a second. Okay. So of the 1,103 extra Chromebooks that were purchased with additional funding, and that was some board funding and some ministry additional technology devices funding, 123 of those are missing, or 11.2%. So summary of uh, 53, uh, 5,453 total Chromebooks uh, that should be in the board, 380 or 7% of those devices that are missing right now. Those are missing and locked. They're no good to anybody. <laughs> so, you know, we were still encouraging schools to keep trying to get your devices back. Um, they're no good. They're just sitting at home. They can't be used. They can't be turned on. They're just not going to work for the student. Uh, we know there's some repairs and damaged devices in there as well that we'll, we'll never get back. Um, overall, the number is very good. A lot better than I actually expected. I expected we'd be closer to the 20% range, so it's, it's not bad. A little bit different story with the internet devices. So 525 uh, Bell Wi-Fi internet devices, 48% uh, 48 or 9.1% are currently being used right now for remote learning students or virtual learning students. Uh, 248 to 47.2% are available at the city in the back, uh, the board office cleaned, ready to redeploy if we need them. 
43 are broken and no longer usable. Again, they're very they're very easy to break. They're you know they're different, no different than a cell phone. Uh, unfortunately, 186 did not come back. So those are considered missing. I want I, I don't have missing in quotes here because those are missing. Those are not devices that we would uh, would have just walked away. They were given out specifically for this purpose, and we bought them specifically for the pandemic. Uh, so it's not something the students would have in their hands every day. We also have 50 Khajiit MiFi internet devices. So it's just a different company. There's Bell and there's Khajiit through these. 42 of those or 84% are available. So 42 came back, uh, eight did not come back. Eight are still missing and need to be tracked down. Again, school staff will continue to attempt to recoup all missing Chromebooks and MiFi internet devices. Uh, using the reports that we provided to them, they're still going back to families and trying to contact those families and get those devices back. Uh, from them. Uh, remote virtual learning devices. So we had 413 Chromebooks that were purchased with Ministry uh, additional technology, uh, technological devices uh, funding were retained to support students who are enrolled in remote learning for this school year. So we didn't have to take devices out of the schools for the students who needed them for who are doing virtual right now. Uh, we were able to use the ministry funded devices to cover that off. Uh, any pandemic funded Chromebooks that remain after the deployment, so if we have extras left over, then we'll take and spread those out among the schools based on their FTE. So some schools will get additional devices. Most schools will get the additional devices eventually when this all settles down and we have devices, extra devices to give out. We did keep back 1,200 end of life Chromebooks. So these are four-year-old Chromebooks, but they're still good for remote learning if we really needed them. So instead of going back in and gutting the schools, if we had another shutdown, we will use these devices to get the students back up and running uh, rather than go in and get, take everything out of tech tubs and then try and put them all back in tech tubs when they come back. Deploying these devices will not affect the schools and the devices that are in the schools. It'll save a lot of work for everybody, including my tech team, who are pushed to the lemon for uh, the last 18 or so months. So. And then just I mentioned that we're storing them in case we have to do the shutdown again. All right, Steve, do you want to talk about the next plan? So um, we are working on the next plan, Doug and I, right now, and uh, we've been consulting with Jen and Tammy as we go. You, you know that there are some aspects of the strategic plan uh, that we'll be considering um, a parent portal being one, uh, a potential one to one uh, deployment model. Um, there are some cybersecurity um, recommendations that we heard about through audit committee and so forth. So all of these items will be addressed in, in the uh, in the next IT plan, which I think Superintendent Barnes would like us to have to you in February, if I'm not mistaken. So we're we're getting there with that. Um, you know, there's going to be some things that uh, have changed recently that are potentially going to impact some of that, as Doug was mentioning, availability availability of devices, but also cost. So we were we were able to uh, for the last number of years, for example, purchase Chromebooks for approximately two hundred and fifty dollars a piece. Um, at this point in time, the cheapest Chromebooks we can get are about three hundred and fifty dollars. So the prices has gone up substantially. So that may impact what we're we're able to do financially, and and trustees will have to take that into consideration. I guess when we get to that point in February, um, we're also looking at uh, at the deployment of software across the board. And you know we've had discussions about that in OSAPAC and different things. So. We're doing a, an inventory right now of all the software used in the board, whether it's business side software, school side software, who pays for it, all of these things. We're gathering all that information. We, we'd like to bring it all together into one piece where it's all funded from a, a central account. So that, you know, if someone says to us, how much does your board spend on software? We'll be able to say this much. It's just like when someone says to us, you know, where's all your equipment? I think when we started doing the strap plan stuff with Catherine, she said, do you know where all your devices are, right? She asked me about inventory. And that was, of course, uh, pre-pandemic. And I said, yes, we know where everything is. And we do again now. <laughs> but there was a period of time where we didn't. But it, it's important, like just even from a, a management perspective, uh, 
a financial accountability perspective. We need to know where everything is, what we have, what we don't have, all of those. Um, you know, it, it's a big resource for the board. Uh, that's worth a lot of money. So we have to manage it appropriately. And uh, am I forgetting anything there, Doug? I don't think so. Okay. Okay. So that is a, a, a brief <laughs> update. Uh, there's a lot of work that the folks did over the summer, just a lot, a lot of work. So we we're all extremely impressed. Um, and just even like Doug said, the organization around everything they, they did to try and help schools to be able to identify what was missing and not missing and do what they could to, to help them get it back. Was yeah, it's not it's not like the days when we had labs and everything was in one room. You could just go to the room and check out what was there. But mobile stuff is everywhere and it's in drawers and closets uh, and tech tops. You never know where it is. So yeah, kudos to the team for every, everything that they did this summer to uh, to go out and go through all that stuff. And uh, kudos to the schools for help, you know, providing a room that we can compile everything in at each location, put it together, clean it up, and then help redeploy it back in the classroom. So okay. any questions? Are there any questions or comments from anyone? I have a comment that I can wait till after your question. <laughs> Um, how many staff have you got, Doug? And I should probably have an idea, but I, I'm just thinking this is such an immense amount of work. I can't, I can't imagine. And all the numbers, of, like, this would just not be my nightmare. So, yeah. you know, I'm just wondering what it, kind of staff. It's interesting sure. because this work was mainly the work of the tech team. So, we're talking uh, six techs, you know, one of them is part time between spec ed and, and IT. Uh, the technical support supervisor and then we did bring in some other ones when as necessary just to kind of help them out so we provided helpers for each of the teams so that's how we broke it up but there was about 10 doing this project uh so you know we've got it's a big much bigger department of course but then you know we didn't involve the west wing team the team that's working on the uh, aspen side because they're doing all their thing and you know we've got it uh, unfortunately we've got uh the form uh, people who are working at home and unable to come in because of the pandemic and, and you know, uh, compromised due to medical conditions, so they're not allowed to be in the building. So, you know, we're down staff there. Uh, we were down the help desk person. We just filled this morning. I just got somebody working this morning, which is great. Uh, so, yeah, it's, we ran a reduced schedule of staff all summer, so they really did bust their butts all summer and put in a lot of extra time to, to get this done. And uh, a lot of them, you know, knew this was coming so they took their holidays earlier before the summer they knew the summer was going to be busy so yeah kudos to the entire department for, for everything they did but uh, how many summer students or no no it was just the staff that we had so oh, yeah congratulations it's well done really well done thank you are there any other questions director just, Raponi. thank you mr chair just wanted to extend again a uh, huge thanks to steve and doug and the entire ICT team for all their efforts, as, as Trustee Humphreys mentioned, huge work that is a steady hand behind our organization, making things function effective and efficiently. And just a perspective for the board of trustees, you know, as Steve and Doug have presented, this, this report, this plan really is a tied and affiliated more with, with the previous strategic plan. And, and as Steve mentioned, sometime in the, towards the second semester, we'll get the new plan that that links to the current strategic plan. And there's two pieces just for the board of trustees to keep in the back of their mind. Uh, it's not news to anyone, you know, the, the world continues to change and has changed significantly in the last couple of years. Two parts that add to what Steve and, and Doug shared on that previous slide was just about the fact that for, for some things, uh, we won't be going back. Uh, and one of them, as talk, talking to trustee Gannett, is the nature of inclement weather days. And now that we've been able to demonstrate on a large scale that we can function in an online environment as the mainstream, the ministry has asked us to start to look at the nature of inclement weather days um, and how we do that. And that's just one piece of, of the puzzle that makes life more complicated in some ways, but also represents a change, I think, and a shift in, in public education. The second one I'll put on the table just again for consideration is the nature of our provincial assessments that have moved into a more online context. And therefore, when we start to engage primary, junior, you know, grade nine math, OSSLT in a more online environment, what does that look like for our organization and the mobilization of technological equipment for students to be able to do that? 
And it's not a specific black and white answer. It's just the way we're organizing our organization on a tech front is evolving over time, much like it has in the last number of years. And these factors will start to play more and more into how we do that in an effective and efficient way, how we can do it as at the most low maintenance for Doug and Steve and the team, and most importantly for our students in the facility of engaging in an assessment now online as opposed to paper and pencil. Just two pieces I'll add that is, in my mind, exciting actually in terms of the, the future plans we bring forward. But I know that's a lot of work for Doug and the team on your shoulders, but uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Director Rufoni. I just have uh, one brief comment, and that is, and Superintendent Block alluded to it, just the uh, significant increase in the world we live in due to COVID in uh, our future buying of equipment, tech equipment. Uh, as a trustee and probably my fellow trustees, that's really concerning because I do know that provincial money is tight and it's probably going to get tighter. So just, just that notation, just you, you mentioned numbers about how significantly things are going up in the future. Yeah. And I mean, we're living in more of a technology advanced world, but there's a, a dollar price for that. So come budget time, there's going to be. Yeah. I contacted our vendor last week with regards to the, a few weeks ago with regards to the Chromebooks. And that's why we we're discussing price and you know the difference. Like, like at one point we were paying 220 for a Chromebook, and now it's almost 400. And you know how that's going to affect school boards. I think we're saying even getting hold of stock, they had three, three Chromebooks in all of Canada of the model that we buy. That's all they had in stock. That's all they could get. So you know I don't know how long this is going to last, but uh, you know we just keep plugging through and we get our orders in as quickly as possible, and you know hopefully we get them throughout the school year that we can get those devices in, but. Yeah, it's really going to affect some of the big projects that we want to do for sure. And it's not just Chromebooks, it's laptops, it's access points, it's smart boards, it's everything uh, that the prices have gone up in. And just trying to get all that technology is very difficult. So. It, it, it may mean, and I mean, like, we can, we can be very structure oriented, right? Like, year one, year two, year three, this is what we do. <laughs> and I mean, that's the way we present the plan. So it may mean that we're going to have to think a bit more flexibly, flexible. Yeah. You know what I mean? We're going to have to think a bit differently about um, what the next maybe period of time does look like, because if, if this is a situation where we're going to be in for a year or maybe longer, we might need to flex our plans a bit and, you know, um, stray away from some of our traditional schedules if that's what we have to do to, to make things work. So there are other things that are planned that we're focused on, like the yeah. portal is one of the things, you know, that's something that you could continue working on while you're waiting on Harvard or uh, you could be working on those software upgrades and whether it's a new financial system or what it is that we need those kind of things we could be tackling instead of waiting on devices yeah them. so I think we'll plan for the best yeah. and then we'll sort of flex how we need to probably maybe the best way but. all right thank you thanks everybody thanks, thanks for having me thank you and uh our third item, our last item that we're doing up is our program and our services review cycle for 2021-22. Uh, we're in year one of implementation. I direct uh, our director, Lufoni, is going to present on that topic. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good afternoon, everyone. Looking to present to the Board of Trustees the renewed plan for the cyclical review of programs and services offered by the district as part of the current multi-year strategic plan which includes, of course, the sound stewardship of our resources, whether it's human, material, or fiscal, for the effective, efficient operation of the organization. I'll start just by referencing the two attachments. One is um, really the beginning in year one of implementation with a new strategic plan, a new four-year cycle, and you'll see an attachment A, the first year, of course, 2021-2022, uh, and then the next two years in columns beside it, and I'll reference both of those years in the presentation. And attachment B is a historical summary of the, the really the major programs and services that we reviewed from 2012 through to 2021. And so you've got really the past five years of my time and, and the five years prior to my arrival at the district that just gives you a sense of the major plans that we've covered for a bit of context for you. As background, the strategic plan, really the intent of the cyclical review of programs and services is to ensure that all students, staff, and school communities of the district have access to evidence-informed offerings of the highest possible quality system-wide. We know that no program or service is perfect, 
that it continues to evolve over time, and we are striving to make it as evidence-informed as possible, both in terms of the value add for our district, but also a scan of the environment, both locally, regionally, provincially, nationally, internationally, for programs and services that are of benefit to students more broadly. There's three categories for the proposed uh, review of programs and services, very similar to our past categories with one minor exception. One is formal reviews. They're, of course, more extensive in nature. They are the most time-consuming from a perspective of staff. Also, program implementation and monitoring. So beyond a review, we tend to spend the next couple of years actually monitoring the implementation to see how it's going. And I'll make a comment shortly on that as well. And the third one is Ministry of Education-led reviews of curriculum policy documents. There's a note there that the ministry used to put out a long-range schedule for those reviews so that you knew in advance as really in the education sector what was coming. That is not quite as um, as uh, precise right now. Uh, there are reviews that are underway in the ministry and a number of curriculum documents that come out, but we don't have a, a long-term schedule for that. We tend to find out somewhere between about a year and six months before it's released. And sometimes we find out weeks before it's coming out. A great example of that, of course, is the grade nine math curriculum that came out in June for implementation in September. So there's timelines do vary from the part of the ministry with respect to what's coming out. With respect to our current status for this school year, by, by far the most um, influential and important, I shouldn't say important, they're all important, but the most a significant review on a formal nature is the secondary school review, which includes FSL programming at the secondary level. And I'll speak again to that when we come down to a bit of the uh, program monitoring and implementation. Uh, and as part of the secondary phase of the visioning exercise, so the secondary school review forms that second leg of the visioning exercise. Uh, we're really looking at currency policy direction and funding parameters provided by the ministry as well as promising practices for program pathways within the district's own context. Key topics or themes for that secondary school review, of course, program pathways, student success, experiential learning, virtual learning, and transitions to and from secondary school. Post Thanksgiving, uh, of course, today, we're uh, beginning the re-engagement discussions related to that secondary school review with our stakeholders and recommendations from the committee will be brought forward to the Board of Trustees for consideration uh, in the winter and the spring of 2022, with both short-term and long-term implications, depending on what recommendations come forward. In addition, as Steve just mentioned in the most recent report, we will be looking at the ICT plan for 2022 to 2025, which is another layer that ties to the secondary school review, but is a, a really a, a review of its own. Further, beyond the formal reviews, the two that are noted there, there are two elements of, of the uh, implementation and monitoring. The first one is continuing to monitor our FSL programming at the elementary level. You'll see in a report coming up shortly that uh, it has had an impact, along with a number of other impacts on our enrollment within the district, and we'll continue to monitor it on two fronts. One is the enrollment overall. The second is looking at FSL in the context of the impact on English with core French programming for the district. So over the next year to year plus, we'll continue to monitor those numbers. Those trends in enrollment will be more stable for us as a district. We'll be able to see where parents and guardians are choosing to place their children in those early years of public schooling, and then talk a little bit more in, in an iteration coming up in the next probably two years around what those numbers look like for us as a system. The second part uh, led through Superintendent Poirier, of course, is the special services, continuing to look at the recommendations from that formal review and how that's implemented and monitored uh, throughout the system. Again, the review from 2019. Last but certainly not least, and, and Superintendent Barnes has always has this on our radar, uh, the piece of around board administration. One of the elements for the Board of Trustees to be aware of, we've got multiple central sites. Uh, at some point in time, as an organization, we're going to need to decide what to do with them. Uh, whether we place funds in, in this spot, call online one, this spot. 
investing in some upkeep that's required for those buildings, including uh, the board office, Mary Street, and our plant facility, or whether we look at a different configuration for our central staff. And it's, um, to be frank with the board of trustees, this was an item on the agenda when I first arrived in the district five years ago. No one ever wants to speak about spending money on board administration because our primary focus is our students. But we do at a certain point in time need to make some decisions for the longer range of the organization. And you can't simply just keep going without some of those investments. So that's something that we place on the, uh, the table for the board of trustees, not for today or tomorrow, but for some time in the near future. In addition to all of the efficiencies in back office elements, as, as Jen often shares with us, that we continue to look for to optimize funding that goes to classrooms and schools for the benefit of students. So I did want to mention uh, those two pieces. And as a final comment, and then open it up for any questions you may have, there is one uh, service when we think of our four services, corporate, employee, program, and special um, as services of the organization that we had on a rotation, uh, for lack of a better word, for review. Started uh, when I arrived with an element of corporate services, which was long range accommodation planning, which we spent time at a retreat with. We then moved on to the special services that Jacqueline and her team had really led for us, as, as you well know. Um, we were going to be moving on to the employee services, and we had that on last year's uh, cyclical review of programs and services. But in speaking with Superintendent McIntyre, uh, really, you know, um, with the busyness that Brent and his team are under right now, with everything from vaccination attestation aspects to all of the health and safety measures, just felt on balance in speaking with Brent that it was best to shift the employee services one to a later date and time. There's no rush for those service uh, reviews, uh, such as employee services. So that one's off the table for this year, and we will not lose sight of it and revisit it sometime in the future when we can balance those elements out without any undue stress on a, a very, very important and busy aspect of our organization as it stands. So uh, without any further commentary, if there's any questions, happy to. Any questions or comments? Again, uh, Trustee Humphreys. I have a lot of questions today, obviously. Um, I, you mentioned the infrastructure or board administration structure piece, and I know that's been discussed a number of times. Do we have some data or do we have, we started to kind of pull together options? Like, I, I just wonder how far along we are. And, I, and I, I'm not sure ebbs and flows a bit because I know the last year and a half has been overtaken by COVID issues, but I just wonder kind of how we're or we are down through looking at some possibilities. In my my time here, we've spoken about it at executive council twice with with substance. I mean, we've mentioned it a number of times, but we've spoken at it a couple of times. Last time was pre pandemic. Okay. And uh, to be to be fair, uh, and I'll turn it over to Superintendent Burns for for additional commentary. It's tricky for us because there aren't ministry funds that are specifically designated or sweatered, so to speak, for for this kind of thing. Um, and at the same time, in fairness to Jen and and, uh, and Bill and, and Lisa prior to Jen, this has been something that has been mentioned. And again, you you can only wait so long before you start making decisions on what to invest and when. So we've had a few discussions of substance, uh, but haven't really aren't formulated. And Jen, jump in here when you're ready, but uh, not formulated to make a recommendation to the board yet because it is complex and because we're going to have to be strategically sound and sensible with how we allocate and reallocate monies and it's not cheap so to speak to you know, reorganize ourselves in, in some other capacity beyond what's currently existing but we know the current format is not sustainable forever and ever yeah and i guess um it's been on the table i think that's a report from 2003 so it's not <laughs> um it's, it's it's raised its head a couple of times um you're right 2000 and 18, I think, is the, the last time we looked at in earnest. Um, a lot of what sort of brings these situations up is, is um, uh, the state buildings are in, infrastructure is in, so whether it's the roofing, whether it's the ventilation, uh, windows, all sorts of things. And uh, Mary Street, in particular, has got some really high numbers attached to it now. Um, it's an older structure. Uh, so that sort of brings the issue to our forefront. Fortunately, we've had this pandemic teach us that there are lots of different ways people can work than simply driving to a building and working from an office. And when I think of Mary Street, and I'm not completely familiar with it, 
but I understand there's central staff there that maybe um, could be in other places. Do they, you know, do they need to come to that central central building? So that's got to be something we have to look at. See what what um what happens there. Does it need to happen there? Um, are there spaces that they can work in that would be differently? Can we set it up differently? And then we look at the cost of doing everything, right? So we'll we haven't we're nowhere near the options. We're just sort of figuring and figuring it all out. And then we'll look at the cost of everything, the efficiencies that the options might offer, um, the risks that they might um, re, uh, delay or postpone, um, and that sort of thing. And then it'll be it'll be much easier to make a, an informed decision because anything we do is going to cost money. And as Kino uh, pointed out, it's not ministry funded when they're in, in buildings. So there is money set aside from um, POD, we call it, uh, uh, previous sites uh, that we proceeds from disposition. So there is some money set aside, but it will require a decision to actually make use of it. So is, is there is there a discussion or looking at partnering with other organizations, other municipalities? Like I don't I don't know what the options might be, but you know, that's another yeah, that aspect that might be worth it, looking at depending on what's available and yeah, who's so, out there, because that would be an interesting option as well. Yeah, and I think before we start to look at what's out there, we have to look decide what is it we're looking for what and when i think of you know what are the functions that we would be moving somewhere um or do they need to stay there or and you know could, you know and that sort of thing so i think it's just and i know that there is a report out there a lot of this work has been done so it's not starting from scratch it's really just dusting off you know the cover and, and making sure that it's as up to date as it needs to be to move it forward so yeah. but the pandemic has taught us um and doug's team as you saw he has supported everyone with pretty much the ability to work and connect uh, from different places of, as opposed to being in offices next to each other. So that might also be something that we, we you know, bring into it. Justin Shields. And a, to follow that conversation, we had, a, uh, we had an opportunity, we, well, we lost an opportunity to Purchase Algonquin College, the old college uh, site, which would have been perfect. There was lots of room there. We could have got the plant department in that was all set up for that. But the Ministry of Education squashed that. Uh, I, I believe Algonquin is, is provincially funded also. It would just mean that the, the government could have pulled that off for us. So, I guess my question is. If we do come up with a plan, does the government have to approve that? They, yes, yeah, we will have to bring it forward and uh, seek approval. Now they have made slight um, adjustments to that 444 regulation 444 slash 98, which is uh, uh, the same regulation that we follow when we are when we deem a property to be, to be surplus. Um, Westmead, for example, or Madawaska, most recently. Um, we need to offer it to other levels of government um, and that and Algonquin College post-secondary three one municipalities. And so uh now if, if Algonquin was to be offering that up, we would then be an organization that they could offer it to. So if it's if it's within that regulation, it's a little bit easier if we were to be looking at acquiring another building. Comment for you, Mr. Chair. These all of these reviews, as Steve uh, pointed out in the ICT one, will function like an accordion. We'll move it quicker and sooner when we can, and slower and longer when we can't, um, because the chances of it falling beautifully regularly during a pandemic period are highly unlikely. And so we've just got a plan for the flexibility that Steve spoke to, whether it's the ICT plan, the secondary school review, or, or you know, it's just that the board has been bust for that. Thank you, Director Picoli. Any other questions or comments? Seeing none, we just have one uh, small but important item of business that uh, the Chair Humphreys would like to briefly discuss. Just a bit of a reminder, it seemed to fit better under of a trustee in this committee than, than the finance committee, which I'm chairing today. I just wanted to remind people about the, the OPSPA survey on transitioning from the COVID-19 experience. 
uh, as you recall, they are putting together a discussion paper around this that will um, hopefully provide some uh, guidance to the government as we go forward in this. And this is a, a survey that is open to the public. Um, everybody is, is encouraged to participate in it. Um, I did have it embedded in the um, uh, in the OSPA report last month, and I can send it out again if you'd like. But I'm wondering if we can also highlight it on our social media somehow, because I would love to have parents involved in this and, and students, you know, through through our student trustee, perhaps. But uh, we need to get people's input on this. this I, I think this is pretty important, and uh, I feel we we're going to lose lose the opportunity if we don't take it now to provide this input. So I just want to encourage anybody, if you haven't done it yet, to do so. November the 30th is the deadline, so we have a bit of time. But I'd love to see it also um, highlighted on our social media pages if we can. And um, I don't know what possibility it is, is John, but uh, just, just to really try and get get people aware of it. Because I, you know, I think if you ask people what they'd like to see in the future for education, they might have some really thoughtful ideas, but if they don't realize they're being asked, I don't, just don't want to miss the opportunity. Do you share that already, John? I'm just checking. I thought we did. Yeah, I think we have shared it already. We have already. We will. I know you did the, 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 the trustee code of conduct. Oh, maybe that's what it was. Yeah, but I don't think you've done Okay, we'll definitely that. double check that. I know the code of conduct survey was through the Ministry of Education, so that was really perhaps easier to do. But if we could do this one too, I'd really for sure. For sure. Yes, Trustee Shields. We could include that in the school newsletter. Parent count on the school council. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Thank you. So, are there any conflicts of interest? Thank you very much. All right. So, we will continue with the one item that we have. Will be presented by Lisa Okay. I forget Lisa's title. Mental health lead. The mental health lead for mental health advocates. And um, I, I think everybody is very, very familiar with Lisa. She's been a great person as before. And it's interesting to hear what's coming up today, Lisa. So, Renaud, uh, would you like to make any introduction of Lisa or of the things that we're going to be discussing? Sure. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Lisa, someone who doesn't need any introduction with for with uh, this group. Um, we've been very very fortunate to have uh, Lisa leading with a very steady hand, with the lead with care uh, over several years, and that has helped create cohesion and provide common language. Uh, for everyone across the district and that's been recognized internally but also uh, our, our partners at school mental health ontario uh, acknowledge and recognize the work lisa has done in establishing this culture across the district um, in working with school mental health ontario over the last few years uh, we we've, we've really increased the amount of support um, especially during the pandemic. But the reality it remains that almost half of our students don't feel that their mental health needs were met. So this is where there's a bit of a disconnect where we're providing more support, but still lots of students feeling that they're, that we're not meeting their needs. Uh, so it's with that in mind that we continue the work, uh, I would say hand in hand with a school mental health Ontario. And what Lisa has done is, uh, develop an action plan for the upcoming school year that is directly connected to the priorities that school mental health has provincially and there's certainly um, good logic to this uh, as we continue to uh, be challenged by the pandemic and uh, school mental health ontario meeting meeting a being a real partner with uh, the ministry uh, on supporting uh, all districts it makes sense to align our work to that. Uh, Lisa has developed a plan that has three pillars. So promoting and amplifying the protective influence of schools, um, identifying and addressing emerging and escalating mental health needs, especially where students have been really impacted or disproportionately impacted by COVID-19. And in, we, we want to continue to build a, a, a strong and sustainable safety network across the school district, but also across our communities. So without any further ado, I'll turn it over to Lisa, who will take us more in depthly into uh, the, the components and the, the pillars of the plan. So Lisa, over to you. Thank you so much. I just shared my screen. So hoping everyone is able to see the presentation. I'm gonna just move into present view. So it should be hopefully large enough for everyone to follow along as I walk us through and highlight some of the key things that we'll be focusing on this school year. So as Renald mentioned, the action plan is reflective of the priority areas identified through School Mental Health Ontario, but it is primarily designed to be responsive to the needs of students within our school communities. Before I talk about some of the priority areas and the action items that we have planned for this year, I just wanted to take a few minutes to foster a shared language and understanding of the mental health continuum and how our lead with care, create a responsive environment, provides a tiered framework that is designed to be responsive to the continuum of mental health needs. As you can see on the slide, the green section of the continuum represents a healthy state of being and the experience of positive mental health. In this state, students function optimally, demonstrating the capacity to enjoy life and deal with the challenges they face, leading to positive outcomes for academic achievement and well-being. Next on the continuum are states of reacting. This involves temporary states of heightened stress, and or the experience of distress. 
leading to survival tendencies of fight, flight, and freeze. While reacting, students, students may show mild impairment in their daily functioning. And we will notice social and emotional and behavioral signs of distress. This shows up in our students as anger, sadness, aggression, withdrawing, or shutting down from the school community, the academic work, and engaging with peers and staff. Children and youth are at a key developmental stage for learning how to cope with stress and these states of distress. And we know from science that these states are intended to be temporary and reversible. As we come into the world and as we grow and learn and we engage in relationships, we can mediate these temporary states and reverse them through self-care, coping strategies, and social support. The evidence shows that relationships and the presence of at least one caring adult can make a difference in fostering healthy outcomes. Tier one strategies in student mental health involve mental health promotion for all students as part of everyday school life. Just as we need daily physical activity for our health, we also need daily strategies for positive mental health. Principals, vice principals, and school support counselors are part of every school mental health team in every school, and they're integral for the leadership and the capacity building at tier one, which involves the engagement of the whole school community in supporting mental health promotion. We want all staff to have this shared language that I'm talking to you about today, so they can promote healthy states, they can engage in mental health promotion in their classroom, as well as recognize and notice when students need connection to the school mental health team. Students showing signs of injury or illness farther down along the continuum will demonstrate moderate to severe and persistent impairment in their daily functioning. Tier two and three involve preventative strategies and access to specialized services. So this may involve our school support counselors consultation with our school board social workers and our referrals to our community partners. So as you can see, the work in providing tiered mental health within education and across the school board involves creating the circle of care around students that involves close collaboration between the home, school and community. The picture on this slide is from School Mental Health Ontario Strategic Plan 2019 to 2022. It will be represented on the next three slides as I highlight our three priority areas and talk about some of the action items to address those areas. I really like this graphic because it helps us to visualize those priority areas within tiered mental health, but also keeps us focused on students at the center of everything that we do to provide tiered support and access to services. You will notice that the tiers are listed on the outside of the circle. So tier one is the green and represents those caring conditions for learning, fostering social and emotional skill development, as well as mental health knowledge and knowing where to get access to support. Tier two is in blue and involves school mental health teams utilizing preventative strategies, as well as intervention for students with mental health challenges. Tier three is the purplish and represents the circle of care and those strong pathways that we wanna have between our home, school and community. So the first priority that I'm gonna talk about from the action plan involves promoting and amplifying the protective influence of schools by supporting the system and school teams with resources, as well as hopeful and aligned communication. This priority focuses on the green areas of the circle. The actions that support this priority involve strategic planning, engagement, communication, and collaboration across the system. The mental health leadership team will form a task team this year to support the transition from COVID to post-pandemic 
and develop a three-year strategic plan that will align with our school board's strategic plan, as well as provincial directions. The superintendents and myself continue to attend provincial and regional school mental health Ontario meetings, which supports this cohesive alignment between provincial and district planning. As the mental health leader, I do wanna take a minute and just express my gratitude to work in a school board that really understands the importance of modeling mental health promotion. I'm pleased to say that wellness breaks have become a regular part of senior administration meetings and provide us with a wonderful opportunity to engage principals and vice principals in leading tier one mental health promotion, both at senior admin and back in their school communities. We're committed to monthly communication to share resources, both provincial resources through School Mental Health Ontario, as well as our board and local resources within the community. Our monthly communication involves staff, students, and parents. And here we are focused on mental health promotion and making sure everyone has access to knowledge about where to get help and support. We use a variety of means to communicate, including email. We have an educator newsletter, the district website, as well as social media. We're also connected with the initiatives to support the continuation of the summer learning capacity building that we did and look forward to continuing our work with student and parent engagement through collaborating with the student trustees, the student senate, and the parent involvement committee. In this work, we wanna strengthen our engagement and our outcomes at tier one mental health promotion for all students. The second priority from the action plan involves identifying and addressing the emerging and escalating student mental health problems and focus support for those that have been disproportionately impacted by COVID-19. The action items in this area target tier two or the light part of the circle. This work involves focusing our efforts on supporting school mental health teams, as well as school board social workers. We've planned monthly team meetings that involve the school support counselors and the social workers. We've divided those meetings into whole group meetings where we will all come together as a group, as well as smaller family of school team meetings to do more focused and strategic work. We've also included this year secondary meetings so that we can focus specifically on the needs of youth in our secondary schools. We also have bi-monthly consultations with a psychiatrist through telemental health, which allows us to present a student of concern and talk about specific strategies, services, and support to begin to support a particular student. Overall, these meetings are planned to really increase and foster our strategies to get at the ground level so students have access to the information, knowledge that they need to be able to reach out for help and take care of themselves and each other's in the school community. The meetings also allow us an opportunity to develop a community of practice where our conversations can focus on those emerging needs, providing support, as well as implementing evidence-based programs. We also look forward to learning more about and supporting culturally responsive and equitable practices and building this into the work that we do in support of student mental health. The professional development this year has three areas of focus, anxiety, attendance, and addiction. These focus areas grew from feedback from school support counselors and social workers, as well as looking at the main area of referrals for service, along with our school survey. So I did want to take a minute just to highlight the data and the actions that we have planned to be responsive to the rates of anxiety that we are seeing um, through our students in the school community, through those referrals for service, as well as what we're seeing on the Our School Survey data. So this graph, as you can see, is taken from the Our School Survey and shows student rates of moderate to high levels of anxiety. So as you're looking, the orange line that runs straight across is the provincial average. 
The green bar specifically represents the data from 2020. And the bar beside it that is white with kind of the marks in it is the data from 2019. So you can see from both years, 2020 and 2019, that we are above the provincial average. And you can also notice that we have an increased rate of students reporting anxiety in the moderate to high range in the 2020 school year. So starting in June of 2020, before we broke for the summer and continuing into this year, starting in October, we will continue our training with school support counselors and social workers in evidence-based programming that will be able to be responsive to students experiencing mild to moderate levels of anxiety as we continue to work and support referrals for those experiencing the more high levels of anxiety and needing more specialized clinical services within a community setting. The two programs that we're supporting within the school board will be the Coping Cat, which is the elementary evidence-based program, and the Cat Project, which will support the secondary panel. The third priority area from the action plan highlights building and sustaining strong safety nets across the district, home, and community. The action items in this area targets the system preparation for risk situations. And the purplish part of the circle, tier three, which is our collaboration of those strong pathways. The actions in this area involved increased awareness of our school teams for supporting students. We're also going to continue building capacity in suicide prevention and intervention. At the beginning of this school year, we had a mandatory health and safety module for all staff that focused on suicide prevention. We'll continue providing training and safe talk for all staff, as well as assist applied suicide intervention skills training for our principals, vice principals, and school teams, or those that principals identify as in a key position to intervene and support students. So for example, a lead teacher. We'll also be doing training in violent threat risk assessment with principals, vice principals, and school support counselors. And we are involved in the development of a shared protocol with the community so that we can begin to be responsive to students who may show signs of human sex trafficking, as well as provide training across the system meeting the different levels of knowledge needs with respect to human sex trafficking. On a final note, we are updating forms, conducting training, and implementing a secure data management system for storing, sharing, and reporting student mental health information and making referrals to community partners. The database has been a system in development for a couple of years, so I'm extremely pleased to say that we are at the stage of implementation and will be using the database this school year. It is through all of these actions and being alert and responsive to the students' lived experiences that we plan to continue to make progress in our lead with care approach and build our capacity to be responsive to the continuum of mental health needs for the students in Renfrew County. Thank you so much. And I'll turn it over for questions and I'll stop sharing. Bye -bye. Thank you very much, Lisa, for that very um, precise planning uh, document that you sent us. And uh, I'm happy to see the relation of that to the to the um, school climate survey that was done and that the anxiety is being picked up on for particular training. And I'm also very happy to see in your right-hand column the, um, the costing of the training for teachers and um, administrators and staff in general. So it makes a very complete program. So thank you very much for that. Are there questions for Lisa? Uh, Trustee Shields. Yeah, something I, I, I didn't hear. Maybe it's it's written into this all, but how, how much impact does uh, the internet, social media have on the, the mental health, the uh, well-being of students? I know, like, like Facebook, if you listen to just about any news, Facebook is taking quite a, a beating over uh, manipulating students into these. Uh, social media platforms and 
and activities. And uh, you know, you hear people saying that parents, uh, in particular, the students that are being bullied here on on these platforms, they have no safe place. Like, you know, it used to be if you got bullied at school, you went home and it was safe there. But they they got students addicted to these platforms, and uh, there's no safe place for them. I just wondered, is this part of um, should this be part of the plan? Is like the bullying? Well, that's one aspect. But is how do you handle the the students with their mental well being that are being bullied? It, it's something that's not really visible. I mean, it, I don't know. Is that part of uh, the plan at all? Yep, that's a great question. We we do know from research there's certainly a correlation between um, students utilizing social media and being online um, and their mental health. So we know that there are some parameters um, that are provided through public health around the amount of time they should be online or utilizing social media to more benefit their mental health. I would say it's not explicitly built into the plan for this year, but it is part of our responsive strategy when we work to support individualized situations in which students are experiencing. Um, so that would be through our school support counselors and our social workers, as we begin to engage with students, learn about the difficulties that they're having. If that is a component, then we will address that as part of the interventions and support that we provide. I will also make a note that as the lead for violent threat risk assessment, there's often a social media component um, in terms of messages being shared um, through social media and that as part of the violent threat risk assessment response, um, we do share that information with those that sit around the table. The police often support the investigation component in terms of looking further um, if there is a criminal aspect to the situation but it is certainly something that we're responsive to on an individual basis. And we do have access to presentations um, that we can utilize to build more capacity for this school community among students. I'm wondering if, uh, if PIC and, and school council could be play some sort of a, a role in this. Because one of the things they were saying is that if parents are watching what their their kids and their and the students are doing on these platforms, you know, it really helps, uh, you know, to, to get them out of this addiction to it and that sort of thing. I just wonder if they have a, a place in, in the plan at all. But, uh, so the parents are aware of what's what the dangers are. Yes, absolutely. And that could, you know, certainly be part of our engagement um, for student and parent engagement as we ha begin to engage and have conversations about the priorities and things that they're um, looking to address. Uh, thank you very much. Um, thank you very much for your, your report. Uh, it's very, it was just excellent as usual, very timely uh, and uh, rather, uh, Concerning, we've been uh, you know looking at uh, uh, well uh, mental health and wellness for a number of years now. We started it when things were pretty good. And yet the uh, you know the stats that we were looking at then uh, showed a big problem. But then we just fell off the cliff into uh, pandemic times, and things just got so much uh, worse. I'm looking at uh, on the first page here, uh, and it really is quite startling. When the our school survey says 20% 20, 20 of respondents felt their school had supported the mental health throughout the pandemic, while 45% said their needs had not been met. I can only imagine what it was like if we hadn't had a portal like this in place uh, at that time. Would these stats be? representative of the, the kind of stats that we would see across the province? Or is this more particular to our board or, you know? Yeah, that's a great question. 
So those were additional questions that we added to our school survey. Um, so they wouldn't be the standard questions that do come with the our school survey where you get that more kind of comparison across the province. Um, so I'd have to look further into, into that to see if there are other boards that are asking kind of similar questions to us. Um, and just of a note, um, in preparing for today, I did reflect back on the 2019 data in comparison to the 2020 data and did notice um, that more students in 2020 felt that their mental health needs weren't being supported, um, which would make sense given the pandemic and the increased rise in needs. Um, but it is certainly something that we, we want to target and be responsive to and monitor so that we are listening to those voices of students and hopefully seeing an increase in those metric measures. I, I think that's that's one of the most important things is we really do have to listen to what students tell us. Uh, sometimes the information that we get from them is not overly clear, but this just stands out. So there is a huge problem. I would imagine that problem is right across the uh, the province. There's probably other sources that would tell us that. Uh, I don't think we're unique, but uh, just looking around our own backyard, there is a major problem there, and we have to address that. And thanks to you, you know, I know we, we, we are, but it's a it's a huge problem. Absolutely. Did you have a question? No, I don't. Uh, Trustee Gannett. Uh, good afternoon, Lisa. Mike Gannett here. Um, sort of a bit of a follow-up with uh, Trustee Morris, and that is, I think that because of the pandemic, these numbers have been amplified. But on top of that, I mean, for years we've heard that Renfrew County has a lot of poverty. I know that, you know, the province, there's always pockets in communities, towns, cities that have their own fair share of poverty. But statistically speaking, I think with the isolation because of COVID, I, I do think the, the poverty has also been a factor. And just look at food prices alone. It's not one thing of many, um, you know. Uh, it, it just uh, it's concerning to me, but I do think that part of the rise in that statistic does have, to some degree, do with we live in a, a, a sort of to some degree a high poverty area in Redford County, generally speaking. So I just wanted to make that as a note because I do think that that has amplified the impact of poverty. And then, therefore, mental health, the isolation piece, and all of that. So it's more of a comment than a question. I just, I do think, I, I, I'm not sure what your thoughts are on that, but I do think that is a factor. How much? I, I'm not sure. Yeah, thank you, Mike, for your comments. And I would agree. I think Renfrew County is a a unique area geographically um, because we are rural, um, and we can see consistently through the our school survey and the research about our community in Renfrew County that we do have higher than normal rates um, of not just poverty, but also mental health concerns, addiction. Um, so there is certainly um, targeted focused efforts that need to be made to be able to listen to our students and be responsive so that we can improve those outcomes. Thank you. Any further questions or comments? interesting discussion at the moment thank you would you like to say something more quickly no oh, i will then i'm like uh trustee Gannett. i get to say thank you to lisa thank you again lisa very much for being here and uh helping us get a slight insight into these significant problems of mental health which several have commented on as being high in this county and um, we're glad that somebody like you is looking after it and your team. So thank you very much again for being here and we look forward to hearing from you again. Thank you, thank you very much. Pleasure to be here. And that concludes the business of the Equity Inclusion Committee. And I would like to um, do an adjournment and have a second term. Thank you, Dave. Trustee Fields, and this meeting is now adjourned.
So Chair Morris, do you want to take a 10 minute break before we go into finance and resources? What's your thoughts? Uh, well, we uh, we planned on having a break uh, in the evening. You're right. Uh, and we had to say 15 minutes, but we have to take 10 because the discussion has been so open to that term. Uh, <laughs> the last uh, two uh, committees, we have to stand beyond what we thought we would be doing. And that's a good thing. So uh, we'll be 10 minutes and then we'll come back to, uh, to plan. Thank you. <laughs>
here. Yes. Can you guys invite me? Right off, thanks, Steve. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm uh, sitting in for Trustee Bowler, who is not able to be with us this afternoon, and he asked if I would cover off the Finances and Resources Committee, which I was uh, pleased to do. So I'd like to call the Finances and Resources Committee meeting to order. Are there any other adjustments to the uh, to the uh, agenda? We currently have two items. Is there anything else to be added? Seeing none, could I have a motion to approve the agenda? Trustee Shields and a seconder, Trustee Morris. Thank you very much. All in favor of this agenda? And that's carried. Thank you. Are there any conflicts of interest based on these agenda items? Seeing none, thanks you very much. We'll move forward with the first one. And uh, both of our items today are ones that do come to our table uh, annually. And uh, I'm pleased to uh, ask uh, Superintendent McIntyre, who I believe is on screen with us right now, to bring us an update on the enrollment, staffing, and class compliance report. So, Superintendent McIntyre, over to you. Thank you, Trustee Humphreys. Appreciate it. Um, before I get started, just I'd like to acknowledge the work of the HR team on not only preparing the report, but also on operationalizing the numbers that are before us. Uh, so a big thank you to that to to my team in that department and also to uh, I see Don White is here she also helped with this report uh, doing some editing as she prepared it for your package so thanks to Don and you know a quick thanks to all the admin assistants who really help us uh, in a lot of tasks that help us keep things organized and presentable as we as we work through them so thank you to that group as well uh, so the report that you have before you is entitled information report on enrollment staffing and class compliance uh, the purpose of the report is to provide the board of trustees with a summary of updated information related to enrollment staffing and compliance with the regulation regarding ontario class size in order to ensure the effective and efficient operation of the organization through the wise use of resources as you can imagine as everyone knows i think uh, I think staffing uh, accounts for about a little over 80% of our budget. So it's, it's a very, uh, it's a big ticket item for us. So uh, the contents therein are significant in terms of their dollar values. Uh, as a background, uh, as you know, each year exec council meets to review actual elementary and secondary enrollments to make necessary staffing adjustments for unexpected fluctuations in numbers. The HR team, school principals and exec work closely with our union partners to ensure compliance with uh, ministry and collective agreement guidelines. And you'll see noted there, uh, the regulation requirements are as follows. So for our kindergarten classes, the average class size is 26. We also have to have 90% of our primary classes must have 20 students or fewer and not to exceed 23. Our junior intermediate levels class average is 24 and a half and our secondary school average class size is 23. So those are the parameters we work within. Uh, you'll also note that our secondary schools, not listed here, but have uh, class caps uh, based on um, what level the courses are running at uh, and their outline in the collective agreements uh, as well. I won't go through the definitions. Those are put there for you and for, for others who uh, may not be familiar with some of the, some of the lingo. 
So I'll just leave those there for your uh, review. And I'll get into the next heading called secondary enrollment and staffing. Uh, you'll note that our enrollment projections in March were 2,965 for our secondary schools. The actual enrollment as of the 1st of October is down approximately from projections by about 20 students. We had our initial placement meetings uh, in the spring, last spring, and there were nine teachers, which represented four and a half full-time equivalents, equivalents, who were surplus, and 12 teachers, or 10 and a half FTE, who were redundant for a total of 15.0 FTE. Currently, 12 teachers who are surplus and eight teachers who are redundant for a total of 13.66 full-time equivalent. And some of these teachers uh, have secured actually long-term occasional assignments uh, as the fall has unfolded. Uh, additionally, over the past couple of weeks, <clears throat> you'll see that we've allocated seven additional sections to fix class size uh, cap issues at the following schools. I won't read them out, but they're there for your uh, information. Uh, we did allocate extra sections to Armprior, Mackenzie, Opiongo, and Renfrew Collegiate. Uh, the secondary panel is currently compliant with class size caps based on local language, and some one over exceptions were made with agreement from the OSSTF union executive. Uh, the total number of teachers in the secondary panel at this time is approximately 225 uh, teachers. Two temporary letters of approval have been secured from the ministry for French as a second language, long-term occasional positions. Switching gears to elementary, uh, projections in March were 5,868. Um, following the initial staffing meeting, there were nine teachers declared surplus and 17 teachers declared redundant for a total of almost 18 FTE. The actual enrollment uh, in September was up uh, 303 students to 6,171. And currently there are five teachers, elementary teachers who are surplus or redundant. And the total number in the elementary panel at this time is 387 uh, teachers. Uh, we are currently preparing the class compliance report based on the Ontario class size regulation. So we have to submit our data to the uh, ministry to make sure we're compliant with the elementary panel. Uh, that work is ongoing. Uh, we expect it to be completed by week's end uh, and that is a tool that uh, really holds us accountable to the class size numbers that i mentioned and we're on the first on the first page um, so i expect that 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 will happen at the end of the week uh, just of interest elementary french is a second language three temporary letters of approval and one letter of permission have been secured from the ministry for fsl ltos we had eight new qualified teachers, uh, FSL that is, who were hired into permanent positions this year. And there are currently, we're currently looking for three FSL positions that are remaining, are remaining unfilled. Moving along to ECEs, our uh, early, childhood early childhood educators who work in our kindergarten classrooms. Uh, and you'll note that ECEs are required for kindergarten classrooms with 16 or more kindergarten students. Uh, based on enrollment and class compositions in May of 2021, 41 ECEs were required. Following initial staffing, 41 of 48 ECEs were staffed, five redundant, one leave of absence, and one retirement. Currently, all permanent ECEs are staffed, including two ECE instructional uh, partner positions created from the system investment funding, also known as the local priorities funding. It's an it's a envelope with many names. Uh, the total number of ECEs at this time is 47. Uh, along to EA staffing, based on funding, the allocation for staffing purposes in April of 2021 was 173 FTE. As a result, two employees were declared surplus. Since staffing, only one employee remains unstaffed as they have elected to remain on recall for the coming school year, the current school year. Changes since the beginning of 2021-2022 school year included additional 1.0 FTE permanent positions at Champlain for three, Highview for one, Valor for one, Walters Addo for two. One position at Mackenzie Community School has been declared surplus with the affected staff member claiming a vacancy at another school. Our present FTE as of September 30th is 179 EA educational assistants in the system. And last but not least, our school support counselor group 
the allocation staff uh, for staffing purposes in April 2021 remained the same at 24.9 FTE. One SSE was initially not staffed to their full entitlement, but the member has been since fully staffed. Since the beginning of the 2021-22 school year, a 0.10 temporary SSE position was added to support our elementary virtual school. Our present FTE as of September 30th remains 24.9 plus the 0.10 temporary position. And that concludes the report. It's a very factual report this evening um, for your uh, information and attention. And if anyone has any questions, I will do my best to answer. And if I cannot, I'll certainly try and get the answers for you. Thanks, Brent. Any questions, comments? Yes, uh, Trustee Adam. Thank you, Joe. Um, uh, Superintendent McIntyre, are you in a position to attribute attribute this large increase of enrollment in elementary to anything in particular? Um, well, I, I think, I mean, I'm just speculating, of course, but I think, you know, uh, we've had a number of families move in, uh, probably, you know, people in the room uh, have, you know, probably had lots of conversations with your, your neighbors and your community members uh, regarding housing and, and housing purchases and people moving into the area. So I think that's part of it. I also think there's a number of folks who sent their children to kindergarten uh, for the first time this year, having kept them at home last year. So that could be a factor. Uh, and you know, the other part that's I think probably a, a bigger picture, I understand from watching actually uh, the agenda, not a couple weeks ago, I think it was, and they were talking about um an increase in Im immigration across ontario over the last five years of about sixty thousand extra people per year so normally ontario welcomes about one hundred and twenty thousand immigrants per year and in the last five years they we uh, welcomed an additional sixty thousand per year so i think that in itself probably accounts for some of the growth in our elementary schools uh here in the county and across across the province really um so i think i think those are a few of the things and i think you know lastly we also love to think that uh we're offering the families of redford county a great choice in 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 public education uh and we're glad we're glad that they choose us when they make that decision to register the kindergarten kids let's go ahead sure uh, the follow-up thank you very much um superintendent mcintyre perhaps i should have asked my follow-up first since you gave us the good news first so the, the second question is the, uh, the loss of 20 students from secondary is concerning, given that some of those new families whom we all know have moved into uh, the area would also have had secondary level um, uh, students to place. Mm -hmm. And so um, 20 doesn't seem like a large number, but if we're losing them for a reason or if they are choosing uh, a, another option, um, mm -hmm should be concerned. Have you any comment to make on that? Um, well, I'll, I'll let Steve, Jacqueline and Ronald jump in there, uh, or Jen. Uh, I think, you know, the first thing I'll say is, you know, it's important to note these are these are based on projections. Uh, so it's 20 uh, less than we projected. Uh, so that's an important distinction. I know Jacqueline and Steve and others have had conversations uh, around that number because they too were wondering about that. So I don't know, Jacqueline, Steve, Renal, if you guys want to jump in. Sure. Uh, I think one thing that we found was that less students returned for a fifth year than had originally intended. So that was a big part of that. Mm -hmm. I think that's so far all that I've noted as well. But I, I do believe the uncertainty of things for students that are in that 12, 12 plus deciding what they were going to do this fall um did have an impact i'll just add too i think there was a, a potential impact for students who uh you know may have decided to um, keep that part-time job and stay part-time uh in their work and in their school as another potential uh, impact so um you know i think jacqueline and steve have pointed out the things that they they were quick to wonder through when those numbers came up <clears throat> Yes, go ahead. Thank you for the um, point about um, fewer, fewer students coming. 
because I think that um, uh, one speculates or one knows a few. Uh, in the preceding year, there were a number of students who wanted to go directly to college or university, but because they were closed, they didn't want to do it uh, remotely, and they chose to do it this year when they didn't really otherwise would not have done so. But that all changed uh, this year because the universities and colleges have quite early announced that they were opening in person. So that could certainly have um, affected us even more than 20 hours. Yes, because I would say, Marjorie, we have seen schools that have have received new students in, say, different grades, but then that over and out ends up being down the 20. And I think, too, like last year was the first fall of, okay, this is COVID, I'm not going away. Now, like all of us, we're like, okay, this is our re this is a reality that we need to decide how we're going to work through. And if I'm not going away to school, maybe I'm doing, like Brent says, working, capitalizing on there's lots of jobs available right now. Um, maybe not returning to the high school because we're still doing masks and stuff there too, right? So there's limits that I think kids in that age group were probably taking into account and thinking through in a different way than a normal year would be. It must be considered on our counterparts at the tertiary at third level, because now they are dealing not quite with a double cohort, but at least there were one point something cohort where they had to have that get those staff and make economy as well. Yeah, so, yeah, that's it. I had not thought at that point. Very much. Any other questions? I, I, I had a couple of questions, and one was just really a follow up from uh, from Trustee Adams. I mean, it's very exciting to have 300 new elementary students. That's really exciting. And the 20 is not a huge number. Uh, um, but I guess I wondered are, are those 20? Um, across the district or are they are there are there more in certain pockets than others or are they kind of spread across all of our seven high schools this being down to 20 students 20 yeah tammy what's your quick answer <laughs> she'll open her spreadsheet she's on I know. <laughs> I, she did send it to us the other day, but it's not popping up. That's out. okay. I, I just wondered. You know, please, just while Tammy's sure. out there, uh, to fill my gap, that, uh, you know, the loss of students from uh, any sector isn't, isn't ideal for us. But the positive news, even as secondary, is as you go down the grades, the delta actually works in the favor of increase. And so, um, the significant number of Tammy, if I'm not mistaken, that loss was actually in the grade 12 relative to our projections. Moving down to grade 11, to grade 10, and grade 9, we actually, our numbers actually are positive that way, which speaks to some of the increase in elementary in terms of trending that way. So it's a, it's a good sign that way that we're not losing, you know, we're, we're gaining more students than losing in grade 9. And same in grade 10. It's, it's not it's the grade 12, if I'm not mistaken, that was the significant reduction number and that lesser as we and, and, and that makes sense too with the discussion we've had around why that might be would be focused on the grade 12 students. So that, that makes good sense, that's for sure. We did we did have a school uh, one school that was two schools that were up in enrollment and the rest either very close to the same or down. So fellows was up slightly over total enrollment and Mackenzie was up. The rest were either basically the same or, or down. Okay. So there wasn't a big pocket in one corner. It was pretty well right. spread. So that's 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 good. That's good to hear as well. Yes, uh, Trustee Morris. Hey, well, we're, we're talking about a, a decrease of uh, 20 students in the secondary. But that's from the projected number uh, from March. What's the actual difference uh, between October 1st this year and October 1st the previous year? actual numbers i haven't done that comparison yet would it be the same or are we were projecting more but it just didn't materialize or well that is based on projections which is based on staffing numbers which is what brent is dealing with now i know but if it's uh if the numbers are roughly the same october 1st last year and october 1st this year but now we're what's talking about a decrease of 20 that's just off the projection that, that makes a difference in terms of perception 
<laughs> just curious. I think Tammy would probably need a little more time because she hasn't she hasn't done that particular projection. I mean, it's uh, you know as we as we uh, kind of work through these numbers, these ones are fairly fresh, the projected ones. But we can certainly get back to you, Trustee Morris, on the the difference between or the the number October first actual count last year to this time this year. I would um, appreciate. Yeah. Just take, we'll just give maybe Tammy just a chance to cut, not right now, obviously, but oh, you know, she can take her time. That's fine. over the next few days or something, she could probably get that uh, in, into your, uh, into your hands, I'm sure. I would appreciate that. Thank you. You're welcome. And I had one more quick question. I, I know that we've been advertising a job fair for the uh, school board, which is, I think it's got to be unusual. I'm not sure we've, I've never seen a job fair, so. Uh, is that uh, going well, as far as you can tell? I, I know it's coming up, it's coming, I don't know the date's coming up, I believe, yeah. but I'm just wondering if we've had any interest, indication? Well, uh, we've, we've often attended job fairs hosted by other organizations, uh, including career fairs at the faculties. Uh, but this is our first, and my, I shouldn't say it's our first, it's the first that I can remember. Uh, Perhaps there was some other time in, in the history of the organization where, where a job fair was held, but not at, not in my memory. Um, so we're we're excited about it. We're we're hopeful uh, that offering folks um, a chance to ask questions to uh, my HR folks um, about uh, careers and choices within the organization will will benefit benefit us in attracting people to work for us. Uh, we're, we're planning on doing them both in person and virtual. So I'll have my entire department actually farmed out to different locations uh, in the district. Uh, not our schools uh, per se, but um, uh, venues that we've um, uh, you know, rented uh, so we can uh, dedicate that kind of traffic flow and keep the spirit of COVID and COVID regulations intact. Um, so we can, uh, you know, we can invite the communities in to hear about uh, life at the RCDSB. Uh, likewise, at the same time, we'll have uh, two people here in, in the office running virtual career fair, uh, job fair, uh, where one person will uh, organize the participants into little rooms, little breakout sessions to hear about custodial or teaching or what have you. So it's a bit early to say, but uh, Perhaps when it's over, uh, I can bring you guys a verbal update of how it went. Um, we're we're at best hopeful and optimistic that it will help, uh, and we just felt that you know we we have to throw at all the problem that we can think of, and this was one of the ideas that we thought might help. So uh, as, again, we're we're hopeful, and I'll I'll bring forward the the results of the work uh, hopefully at a meeting uh, not too long from now. We hope it goes well. I know it's a big commitment to do something like that, but it does give us an opportunity to uh, to tell what a great organization we are, right? And, and all the good things, uh, the, what, the, why they would want to come and work for us. So I hope it goes well. Keep well, our you. fingers crossed for you, for yeah, sure. Thank you. We appreciate that. Thank you. Any other, other questions, comments? Seeing none, I think we are good. Thank you very much, uh, Superintendent McIntyre, for the information and for Tammy for joining us as well. And uh, Always good to get the data uh, and hear how things are going. And I know you've had a tremendously busy year as well. So thank you for all the work that your team has done too. So thank you. Thanks, Brent. Okay, our second item this afternoon um, is uh, something near and dear to our heart. Of course, our trustee honorarium report and I'll call on Superintendent Barnes to walk us through that exciting topic. Thank you, and actually, uh, my my part in this is quite quite small. I'll just um, pass the, the uh, mic over to Tammy, who's going to walk us through the report, um, uh, and uh, I'll just share it with her. Okay, so this is the report we bring every year. It's for your honorarium for starting December of 2021 till November of 2022. Um, the part that needs to be adjusted every year is the enrollment amounts. So this year we're using the 2020-2021 um, estimated enrollment. Um, this, this is part of the reg that's, they say you use the prior years. So that's a decrease of 77 FTE of students, 7708. 
Um, so it results in, as you can see in the first table, a decrease per trustee of $16.86 per year. On the second page, the second table explains the enrollment amount a little bit better. The very first little box of that um, shows that it's calculated based on $1.75 per pupil. Um, and it shows the difference of the 1686. The other two amounts are a per pupil amount, but it's the greater of the calculated amount or 500 or 250 for the chair or the vice chair. Leave it at that if there's any questions. Okay, questions. Sort of an obvious one. We just went patted ourselves at the back for heaven. An enrollment increase, and now we have a decrease. Which is it? <laughs> so the, because it's based on last year's enrollment, there's okay. a decrease. So next year you should see an increase in your pay for the first time probably ever since I've been here. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, that that'll be a nice treat for sure. It might be seventeen dollars more than we're. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Any other comments or questions? Uh, we know that this is pretty cut and dried. It's pretty standard. Uh, it's all based on enrollment and uh, and those parameters. Yes, Trustee Morris. When was the last time that the the, the base amount and all the other factors were changed? It's basically the same for the past quarter century. Pretty much. Pretty much. Yeah. Well, right. We don't do it for the money. <laughs> and I do think that OPSPA does bring this to the table. I don't know, Dave, if you remember, but it's, been, it's kind of bubbles up now and again. I think it's more fighting for our lives than asking for more money. There, there are always other priorities that, that are just more important, uh, but it, it does it does come up once in a while. And, and the thinking that, you know, it could should perhaps be more in line with our municipal partners. But uh, as as uh, Trustee Shield says, other other things tend to be priority. And so it doesn't get very far, unfortunately. So. OK, if there aren't any other questions, thank you, Tammy, for that. I appreciate it. And uh, thank you, Superintendent Barnes, for introducing. Uh, is there anything else for the good of this particular meeting? If not, then I would look make a motion to adjourn. I look for a motion to adjourn, uh, Trustee Morris and a second or Trustee Gannett. All in favor of adjourning in this meeting? And that looks like it's carried.